بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد <coughs> when Allah subhanahu wa taala created paradise and hell jannah and jahannam the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa taala did was to send Jibril alayhi salam and he sent Jibril alayhi salam to jannah and he said go and see what I have prepared for my slave go and see what I have prepared for my slave who worships me and is obedient to me Jibreel alayhi salam he went and he saw the splendors of Jannah he saw those things which no eye has seen no ear has heard and no mind can comprehend and he came back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he said, Oh Allah, by your glory, there will be no one who will hear of Jannah, paradise, and will want to enter it. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he surrounded paradise. He surrounded Jannah with all kinds of hardships. Hardships upon the soul. Like praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, waking up for Fajr. Giving sadaqah in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doing jihad, hajj, zakat, lowering your gaze, following the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Things that people find difficult. Telling the truth. Being a good Muslim. And then Allah sent Jibreel alayhi salam back and he said, Go and now see Jannah, which I have surrounded with these hardships, trials and tribulations. And Jibreel alayhi salam, he saw all of the trials and tribulations, the difficulties that surround Jannah. And he came back and he said, Oh Allah, by your glory, there will be no one who will be able to enter Jannah. Now it's become so difficult. And similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then instructed Jibreel alayhi salam to go and see Jahannam. And Jibreel alayhi salam, he went and he saw the ferocity of the fire of Jahannam. He saw one part of the flame engulfing another part, enveloping the other part of the fl uh, flame. He saw the horrors of Jahannam. And he came back, he said, Oh Allah, by your glory, there will be no one who will enter Jahannam. It's so scary and gruesome. And then Allah surrounded Jahannam with all those things that help the soul yearn for things, the desires, the temptations, women, intoxication, Power, wealth, lying, dealing in interest, gambling, all these things that will mislead a man, Allah surrounded Jahannam with this. And then he instructed Jibreel alayhi salam, go and see now Jahannam. And similarly Jibreel alayhi salam, he goes back and he sees Jahannam. Surrounded by all these desires. And he said, oh Allah, by your glory. There will be no one who will be saved from entering Jahannam. There will be no one who will be saved from entering Jahannam. And this is the reality of the situation, my brothers and sisters. And I thought I'd begin the talk with this poignant hadith. Just to give us an indication about where we're going in life. What lies in store for us. What is the reality of life. And what is surrounded, what Jannah is surrounded by and what Jahannam is surrounded by. So we know that the difficulty and the hardship that we have in this dunya is the means of us attaining Jannah in the end and us following our desires, not lowering our gaze, wanting to lie and fraud and interest and gamble and all these other things, this will be a path that will lead us to the fire of hell. And it's also mentioned by the Prophet wasallam when he addressed his companions and he mentioned that if you had seen what I had seen, then you would laugh less and you would cry much. Remember the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah took him on al-Isra wal miraj and he showed him Jannah and Jahannam and he showed him the reality of the dunya. And when the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came back, he instructed his companions, he told them that if you had seen what I had seen, then you would laugh less. You wouldn't become deluded by the dunya and you would cry and weep much. So today's talk, inshallah, we're going to look about, we're going to talk about chasing the desires. 
How do we stay away from going to Jahannam? And subhanallah, I spent today a large part of my day traveling. And I arrived here in Bradford. And I spent some time in my auntie's house and then I went from one house to another. And I went on a 15-20 minute journey through Bradford. And wallahi, the sun hasn't even come out properly. And the fitna is out there already. So this is something that we have to understand. That this is something that is going to lead us to the fire of hell. When brothers want to look good and they want to drive around looking for the opposite gender. And similarly we have sisters who are dressing up trying to attract the opposite gender as well. Guys driving around in cars with music blaring. This is a sign that these people are following their desires. And based on the narration at the beginning, this is a path that will lead us to the fire of hell. So this talk isn't just about this is haram and this is halal and stay away from this. Rather this talk is a way of giving the youngsters an opportunity to have a focus in life. And stay away from these things that will trap you in the dunya and will take you ultimately to the fire of hell. So this isn't just about this is haram and this is no, this is about solutions. How do you live in the 21st century where all these desires are right in front of you? And wallahi, in the history of Western civilization, we have never had it so easy. Never has mankind lived in such relative comfort. We have cars, we have big houses, we have en suites in our houses. We have phones, we have iPads, we have Skype, we have everything is so easy in life. But at the same time, our spirituality is being stripped away. Many people have got depression now, more than they ever had before. Why? Because they are following their desires. They have given up following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have given up knowing their purpose in life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Ya qawmi inna ma hadhi al-hayatu dunya mata'un wa inna al-akhirata hiya daru al-qarar Oh my people, this is Allah who's addressing us Oh my people, this dunya is like a mere pleasure, pastime, a passing pleasure Passing enjoyment, a brief enjoyment The real place to be is the akhira Jannah is the real place to be where you will have everything that you want Why have you become preoccupied with the delights of the dunya? So this is something that we must understand and address. How do we live in this dunya? The 50, 60, 70 years that we have, maybe 30, 40. Each one of us, death has already been decreed to us. How do we live in this dunya without succumbing to our desires? So let us look firstly at the creation, the origin of man, you and I. Allah says that we are the best in creation. Better than the angels and the jinn. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, He gave us the best attributes. We have logic and reasoning. The angels don't have logic and reasoning. They just follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for us, we have this faculty of reasoning and logic. We can make decisions. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Bani Adam is the best of my creation. But the same creation which is the most superior of creation can become the most low of creation. Worse than the animals. And you must be thinking, why is Brother Wasim saying this? Well, you can testify to the fact that on the weekends, the same Bani Adam, you and I, who Allah deemed as being the best in creation, you will find people intoxicated, falling on the floor from left and right, drinking, standing up and urinating, Vomiting on the streets, behavior which not even animals do, open signs of affection with the opposite gender publicly in the middle, in, in the open. This is because the best in creation, when he follows his desires, can become the worst of creation. And that's why Allah says, Inna ma tunziru manittaba dhikra wa khashyar rahmana bil ghaib fa bashirhu bi maghfiratin wa ajrin kareem. That indeed Allah has sent down the Quran as a reminder. The Quran as a reminder. The religion as a reminder to the people. The ones who believe in the ghaib. And glad tidings are those to the ones who follow the advice. 
who follow what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned because none of us can see the ghaib. If heaven and hell was brought to us, then even on a platter, then even the non-Muslims, they would follow. But we have to believe in the ghaib. No one of us has seen Allah. None of us have seen the angels. None of us have seen heaven and hell. None of us have seen the day of judgment. But we have to believe in this. And this is believing in the ghaib. And this is an attribute of a Muslim who believes in the ghaib. And he believes in those things that are going to hit us in the future. So Islam is not a restrictive religion. I want to get this point across. Where you might think that we have to become like monks. You know, go away in a monastery and just Allahu, Allahu, like certain people have done. Like certain Sufis, this is how they made the religion. Where you have to abandon yourself from the dunya. Go away and just say Allahu, Allahu and abstain from the dunya. No, Islam is a way of life. You have the hudud of Allah, the laws of Allah that you cannot transgress. You have a way, a system. You get married, you have a family, you procreate, you work, you do business, you eat, you sleep, you exercise, you participate in society, politics, etc. So Islam is a way that shows us everything, that we have natural desires, a desire to have food and drink. A desire to get married, a desire to be loved. All these are natural desires that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put inside each and every one of us. But if we go overboard in following our desires and we go against the hudud of Allah, then this will be a source of destruction. So we have to put these in front of us, the objective about what life is all about. That we have these natural desires, that when you go outside, your mind will take over. You will, you will see things that you don't want to see, you will hear things that you don't want to hear. But how do you overcome these desires? And this is something that inshallah, as the duration of the talk goes through, I will try and give you some information, something to make it easy for you to inshallah follow the hudud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of you, and I prepared this talk for youngsters, and it seems, subhanAllah, that our elders uh, um, uh, equate more than our youngsters. But anyway, I'll just follow the script that I had for the talk. And one thing that many of our youngsters living in today's day and age, the problem that they have, is that they want to mix with the opposite gender. This is again something that comes within our desires. You have many youngsters who cannot control their gaze. And they surrender themselves to their lusts and desires. And remember, lusts and desires is something that surrounds Jahannam. And I want to refer back to the opening hadith. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He surrounded Jahannam with all sorts of things and this was one of them. The lusts and desires. Not lowering your gaze. One being attracted to the opposite gender, maybe music, maybe hip hop, maybe gangster lifestyle, all these things are a means of your destruction. They will take you to the fire of hell. So the first thing that we need to understand is for people, youngsters, who live in the 21st century, where segregation is becoming very limited, that you want to satisfy your desire. And living in the 21st century when you are being bombarded with subliminal messages from everywhere. You're driving the car, you have billboard posters. You're driving the car, you see things that you're not supposed to see. Women are dr dressing less and less, they're exposing more and more. You go home, you put on the TV and again you see things that you're not supposed to see. You have your phones, again you see things that you're not supposed to see. How do you overcome this? And again we go back to the prophetic narration. When somebody came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he mentioned that he cannot suppress his desires and he cannot afford to get married either. Then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned you must fast. This has a direct link to your desires brothers and sisters. I tell you this now. That if you're finding it difficult to lower your gaze today and you're following your desires, start to fast. 
Because as your body weakens, you will not want to look at the opposite gender. Things like this will not appeal to you. But as you eat more and you stuff your belly, then more, this generates more of your desires, especially your carnal desires when it, with regards to the opposite gender. So the first and foremost, the first thing that you must understand, living in a society where you have women walking around and, and all the subliminal messages that you have, billboards, posters, songs, TV, and you're thinking, you know what, I, I'm going to do something now to be like really bad, start fasting. The second thing that you need to do is you need to understand that if you cannot lower your gaze, and you feel that one thing will lead to another, then follow the example of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when a man came to him and he said, look, I cannot control my desires. I just want to commit adultery with the next woman that I see. I'm just attracted to women. I can't help it. And remember, this was 1400 years ago. Not in a time like this. It was a bit more conservative in those days. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, how would you like it? That the woman that you want to commit adultery with was your mother, was your sister, was your daughter, was your wife. And again, this really put the brakes on his thinking, his thought process. And this again is the way you have to understand this. That this woman that you're looking at and you're saying, you know, subhanAllah, she's pretty, I want to get... Imagine this was your mother and somebody's looking at your mother like this. Or is this is your sister? Somebody else is going to be looking at your sister like this. Your wife. Because people don't know somebody's married. They'll see a woman walking on the street. They'll say, look, she looks attractive to me. Again, this could be your wife. So again, this is something that you have to understand. That this woman, person that you're looking at, is somebody else's mother, daughter, sister. How would you like it if somebody was glaring at your mother, your daughter, your sister in this way? And again, this would make somebody stop doing this thing, which obviously again feeds the desires. Something else that Allah mentions in Surah Nur is about lowering the gaze, your eyes. This is the window to the world around us, brothers and sisters. Wallahi, this is the window around. They, we can see everything. We take in everything from these two here, eyes. But these eyes can be a source of destruction for you and I. If you do not lower your gaze and don't look at those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned on the day of judgment a time will come when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will seal our mouths. You know, we can be the best barrister on the day of judgment. That's what we think. Oh, we're just going to say, oh Allah, yes, this wasn't. No, no. I think, you know, the angels must have made a mistake. I wasn't doing this. I was doing that. I meant this. I meant that. No. Allah will seal our mouths. And our hands will speak. And our hands will testify against us. Oh Allah, he used to take me and he used to go to the shop and he used to pick up the cigarettes, put them on the counter and he used to smoke with these hands. Oh Allah, this was the hand that used to pick up a bottle of vodka and drink it, knock it back. The eyes will testify, oh Allah, these eyes... We're seeing things that you made forbidden, O oh Allah, when he thought that there was nobody else looking. He was locked away in his room. He was looking at things that he wasn't supposed to be looking at. The ears will testify. And the ears will say, Oh Allah, he was listening to music. The Quran of Shaitan. The lyrics of Shaitan. He wasn't supposed to be listening to this, O oh Allah. The feet will testify, Oh Allah, he used to walk with me to the nightclub. The feet will say, Oh Allah, he used to walk with me to the college. And we used to be talking to girls. Every body part of yours will testify. And your mouth will be quiet because you will naturally want to defend yourself and lie. And this again, my brothers and sisters, is something that is haq. This is something that will take place on the Day of Judgment. In front of everybody. Imagine, whoever's watching this Oscar, Pistorius, whatever his name is, the trial live, that's taking place, you must be feeling sorry for the guy. Many of us know, perhaps he did do what he did. But the way he's getting grilled and interrogated in front of the world, and he begins to cry. But imagine when we are laid open and dissected in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of everybody. 
and, un and our bodies will testify against us. Imagine the feeling on that day, brothers and sisters, so we can <coughs> stop that from happening by making sure that we lower our gaze and that we look at those things. Don't look at those things that Allah has made forbidden. Don't listen to music. Again, music has a direct and relevant link to your desires. They play about in your subconscious mind over and over again the lyrics. They sink into your mind. And as you're walking, you're talking, you keep thinking back about those lyrics which are generally based about the other gender. Doing this to the woman, being with this woman, loving that woman. And again, this is a way that shaitan is working on all of us. So we have to make sure that we control ourselves. We can either be the best in creation or we can be lower than animals. The choice is between you and us. The choice is between you and us. And there's a narration that's mentioned about a time when the Muslims were expanding. And the Muslims were expanding the lands and they were going out to do jihad. And there was a man who was fighting with the Muslims. And he went out to do jihad and they came across a country, a territory that they had never come across before. The skin complexion of these people was different to the Arab skin. And this man, because he couldn't lower his gaze, and as they got closer to the village and town where they were going to conquer, he became infatuated with the woman. As he was fighting, he saw a woman from a distance of the, on the opposite side, the enemy. And he became infatuated with her. So he would long to try and fight and get into the thick of the battle so he could get closer to the enemy lines, so he can see this woman. And this is what he would do, he would fight with passion. He would fight with conviction until he got closer to her. And then one day he got so close that she realized that he liked him. He liked her. So he went over and he professed how much he adored her. He said that you, I find you very attractive. And her knowing that this man had succumbed to his desire. She said, you can marry me, you can have me. But only on one condition. That you stop fighting against my people. Rather you fight against my people against your own people who are fighting my people and this is exactly what he did because he didn't lower his gaze and he became infatuated with the other woman he went and he began to fight against the Muslims until he died and he died the death of a non-Muslim why because he was fighting against his own Muslim brothers and sisters why because he couldn't control his gaze and I ask you the same question how many times have you been walking the streets or driving the cars and you see somebody and say, I'd do anything for her? Why? Because shaitan has shot the arrow straight into your heart. And he has made you follow your desires. That slippery slope that will lead us to Jahannam. So this is a very important thing that we need to understand about shaitan. Because Allah mentions, Alam ahad ilaykum ya bani Adama alla tahbudu shaitan, innahu lakum aduun mubeen. O children of Adam, on the day of judgment, Allah will say, O bani Adam, <laughs> did I not tell you that shaitan is an open enemy? Did I not tell you that he's going to mislead you all? And on that day, we're going to have no, we're going to have no excuses. Oh Allah, yes, but, but, but. And shaitan will also say himself, he'll say, Oh Allah, I didn't do anything. I didn't point a gun to anybody's head. I didn't grab them by the ear and pull them and said, go here. I just whispered. I just tempted them. And they followed. They followed, oh Allah, I have nothing to do with these people on that day. And then Allah will say, go and join shaitan in Jahannam. Because I told you. I told you that Iblis is your open enemy. Don't follow him. Don't follow your whims and desires. It will ruin your life and the life of those people around you. So this is one very important thing we have to understand that shaitan is your open enemy. And we have a Qareen who is accompanied with us as shaitan. We have a companion from the jinn. And when the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned this to Aisha radiallahu anha, she was amazed. She said, oh Messenger of Allah, have you also got one? And in some narrations the Prophet sallallahu said, yes, I have one but mine has become a Muslim. And in another narration, the Messenger وسلم, said, Yes, but mine only encourages me to do good. 
He doesn't make me do bad things. Go on, message her. Go on Facebook to her. Have a look at that woman when you're driving. Put that track on. Go on, nobody's listening. Who's going to know? Press that button, watch that. No, mine just tells me to do good. So again, I ask you, in order to combat our desires, how much on top of this shaitan are you? The one that's whispering to you as you leave the masjid, making you lazy, making you look at things that you're not supposed to. This is a companion from the shayateen that's with you. You can, make, you can control this waswasa of shaitan by being strong, having strong willpower, or you can let him take you for a ride. A very dangerous ride. A ride which has destroyed the lives of many people. Many houses have been destroyed. Many men and women have chosen to follow the desires and the waswasa of shaitan. And they have done things that I cannot even explain sitting here. Things which have shattered people's lives. So again, I tell you that we all have a qareen, a jinn with us. The one that's constantly giving waswasa to us, but we have to control the jinn. Imagine what a beautiful religion this is. That the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he has not even left any stone unturned. He's told us complete, comprehensive from A to Z, how to live your life. Beware of this, be careful of this, stay away from this, abstain from this. You'll be successful if you follow this. We have all the answers, but it's up to us how we live our life. So again, Shaitan is somebody that we have to stay away from because Shaitan knows our weaknesses. He knows our weaknesses. One of the Salaf, he had a dream. And Shaitan came to him in a dream. And he had all these ropes around a man. And he was pulling at different ropes. And this, one of the Salaf, they asked, they said, what is this? He said, these are the ropes, these are the weaknesses of man. I know every weakness of each and every one of you. And I pull on the weakness of the man. So if the man is, weakness is music, I pull on that weakness chain and I make him follow weak music. If he wants power and money, I pull on that power and money. Everyone has these chains and ropes that I pull. And the Salaf said, the uh, scholar said, he said, what about my weakness? He said, your weakness is, is that you eat too much. And when you eat too much, you become lethargic. You become tired. You become demotivated. And then you lose your potential to be a person who can excel. And he said, Wallahi, from that day on, I made sure that I ate one third. I never ate to my heart's content. Subhanallah. And don't we all see this, brothers and sisters, in Ramadan? We fast all the way through. And then we eat to our heart's content. And then Travi prayer, we can't make it. I leave it. It's too difficult. I want to sleep. Shaitan knows all our weaknesses. He knows that if we eat too much, we have a chance of missing out on that bonus. All the reward that Allah will give us. So we'll say, eat. What's going to happen? Then you eat and then you become tired. You become sleepy. You become lethargic. You find it difficult to get out of bed in the mornings. So what's your weaknesses? You know each and every one of your weaknesses. What part of your lifestyle is it that you find difficult to overcome? Once you know this, then you must address this and be proactive in making sure that you follow those steps. You stick to your salah, you stick to your adhkar, you follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. You see Jannah and Jahannam in front of you and you're striving to attain Jannah. You're striving to stay away from Jahannam. And then bi-ithnillah, everything will be made easy. Because shaitan is very patient. He will take his time. He will take his time. Do you know how long he took on our parents, Adam salam and Hawa? He didn't just come overnight one day and say, look, take from the tree. And they said no. And he said, okay, see you later. It took him many years. Allah said, you can have the whole of Jannah. Everything you want. Things which no eye has seen, no ear has heard. Go to places that you cannot even comprehend. But just that one tree, one tree, stay away from that one tree. Every time shaitan would come and give waswasa to Adam salam, Go on, take from the tree. Maybe you'll become immortal. 
And he would say, Auz billahi min shaitan rajim, leave, 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 no. But slowly over time, he was very patient. He laid out the trap. Until one day, smack, he caught them in the trap. And what happened? Because of this, you and I are in the dunya. Because of this, Allah sent Adam Islam and Hawa to the dunya as a punishment. That leave Jannah, the place which no eye has seen, the most amazing of places, and go and live in the dunya. Suffer hardship, grief and sorrow, anxiety, fear, loss of life. Pains, aches, going to the doctors, going to relieve yourself. All these things. But look what's happened. We've become in love with the dunya. A place that Allah has sent Adam as a punishment, a brief respite here, enjoy yourselves. 50, 60 years, follow me, but don't get too caught up in the dunya, be like a stranger. And we've become engrossed in the dunya. So we must understand that shaitan is a person who will take as long as he, li he likes to make sure that he traps you. And Ibn Kathir brings a wonderful riwayat from the Israeli riwayat about a man who was named Basira, who was a monk, who was a Christian monk, who was the best monotheist person on Tawheed that was living at the time thousands of years ago. He was well known and respected in his village as a person who was Allah fearing. And one day that village had to defend itself from an enemy. So they had to go out and do jihad. So there were two, there were two brothers and they said, Oh Basira, we have a sister and we're going to leave our sister with you because we can't trust anybody else. And we're going to fight in the way of Allah and we're going to come back and we want you to look after her. And remember Basira was a person who was proper muttaqi, pious. He said, how dare you leave your sister with me? Do you not fear Allah? Go. Don't leave your sister with me. How dare you say this? But then Shaitan came and he whispered, he said, oh Basira, if you don't look after that poor girl, are you going to leave that lady? in the company of men in a village? Where's your God consciousness gone? Where's your fear of Allah? Enjoying the right, forbid the, e enjoying the right, forbid the evil? Just take her. So then he said, okay, I have a house next to my house over there. Keep her there. I will look after her. So they say, thank you very much, Basira. They leave the sister. A few days pass, Basira would normally leave food just by the doorstep. Shaitan came, oh Basira, you're leaving the food by the doorstep, she's coming out picking up the food, the people around will see this and they will see that she's living by herself, why don't you take the food and place it inside, make sure she doesn't have to come outside. Basira goes and he takes the food and he puts it on the table, and he comes back out. Many more weeks pass by, Shaitan is playing, he's chipping away at Basira, oh Basira, you need to talk to her about Tawheed. She's got no knowledge. You need to educate her about Allah. So he would go and from behind a veil, he would talk to her about Allah. Shaitan would come. Basira, she can't see what you're doing. She wants to see who you are. Better body language, better communication. So Basira went and he began to talk to her without any segregation, without any third person being there. And we know what the Messenger wasallam said, when two people of the opposite gender are by themselves, the third one is shaitan. One thing leads to another until she becomes pregnant. She becomes pregnant. Nine months later, she has a baby. Shaitan comes back to Basira. Oh Basira, your reputation is at stake. You did adultery, zina with a woman. All, this all these years of hard work is going to go down the pan and people will kill you Basira. Do something. So he goes, he takes the baby from her hands. He kills the baby and he goes and puts the baby in a grave. The woman begins to cry. 
He also gets waswasa from shaitan saying, listen, if you make her, if you keep her alive, she's going to go and tell the whole community, Basira, deal with her too. So he kills her too and he puts her in a grave. Then he goes outside and he digs an artificial grave. He digs an artificial grave. Pats it all up, makes it look proper like a grave. And then he waits and he goes back. A few months pass and the brothers, they come back. Basira, how is our sister? And Basira comes and he says, I'm sorry to say, your sister, she became ill. There was nothing that I could do. And she died and here, look, there's her grave. And they go and they see this raised grave and they begin to cry for their sister. They don't know what's happened to her sis their sister, they begin to cry. And then they thank Basira, thank you Basira for doing what you could. May Allah give you more, you're such a pious man. But then shaitan, being shaitan, he came to both of them in their dream. He came to both of them in their dream, showing them exactly in Basira's house where he had made the real grave under his bed. And where the body of the woman, their sister and the baby was. So they woke up in the morning scratching their head and they're asking each other, I had a really weird dream today. Yes, tell me. I also had a weird dream. What did you have? He said, I had a dream that our sister was buried in Basira's house. He says, surprisingly, I also had the same dream. There must be more to it. Let's go. So they went to Basira's house. And they said, we had a dream that our sister was buried here. And he said, no, 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 I think you got it all wrong. They moved him out the way. They went to the bed, they moved the bed. And down below when they started digging, they found the body of their sister and the baby. They grabbed Basira, they started to beat and hit Basira. They took him to the village council. They said, this is what he's done to our sister. He impregnated her and he killed her and the baby. And they said, this is, this is punishment, is death. We have to kill you. So they get Basira ready for death. Basira, a man who lived a life of piety, worshipped only Allah, stayed away from society, is now going to die by doing adultery. The shaitan wasn't happy here. He came again, Basira. You know, it was me that came to you and I gave you waswasa. I made you go to the house. I made you do these things, I made you get her pregnant. And you know that it was me who did this and I can take everything away. All you have to do, Basira, is just nod to me in approval. Just nod, because that tied him up. No such that, just nod to me like this, affirm me. Just nod that you believe in me and I will make everything go away, Basira. Go back to worshipping Allah, everything will be rosy. And Basira, a man who worshipped only Allah, he falls for the trap of shaitan. He nods in approval. He does shirk with Allah. He associates partners with Allah. And then Basira goes, thank you. Then shaitan goes to Basira, thank you. I've done what I wanted to do with Basira, now you die. And rightly so, they go ahead and they kill Basira. A man who lived a life of piety dies on shirk. This, my brothers and sisters, is how shaitan is chipping away at each and every one of us. Shaitan has no time constraints. He doesn't have to go to work in the morning. He doesn't have to do a shift where he gets tired. His work is working on you and me. That's his job. He doesn't get tired. So we have to understand that this is how shaitan is capitalizing on our desires. And he's making us follow him. So how do you youngsters stay away from the traps of shaitan? And one of the most important things for you to do is to be proactive with your time. When a person is by themselves, they're lazy, shaitan will come and he will make you procrastinate. Lazy. You have something that you're going to do now, you'll say, no, I'll do it five minutes later. Five minutes later, no. One hour later. One hour later, no. Two hours later. Two hours later, no. You know, tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up in the morning, I'm going to be the most energetic person, I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, you're a bit tired, you put it off and off and off. Shaitan is working on you guys. You need to be proactive. You need to be spending your time wisely. Get off the Facebook. Get off the YouTube. 
Get off watching things that you're not supposed to be watching and delaying the things that you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be coming to the house of Allah. You're supposed to be opening the Quran. But shaitan is making us do other things. So you need to make sure that you're spending your time in useful pursuits, not in haram activities. Because if this is happening, shaitan is working his web on you. Shaitan is working his web on you. The second thing, again I mentioned this before, excessive eating. If you start to eat excessively, you've had it. If you start to eat excessively, you've had it. Again, this restricts and puts limitations on a person. You gain, you feel lethargic. You want to sleep a lot. You're not as healthy as you could be. You find that you lack the energy and the motivation. Especially these days, when we live in the 21st century, when we have been deprived of pure sustenance, pure food, pure fresh home cooked meals. We don't have them anymore. Where the real vitamins and the minerals were. We have everybody who's open takeaways and chip shops. And we're being loaded with doni kebabs and all these fattening things which are having a direct impact on us. Making us fat, less active, making us really tired, depressed. Scientists have linked depression with manufactured foods that we eat. All these things like crisps and chocolates and biscuits and fast food, this has a direct link with depression. So if you feel that you eat in the junk food and then you feel tired and you feel sad all the time, then you feel this is because you're eating the wrong foods. You're not eating the healthy food that Allah has given us, the fruit, the meat, the chicken that we have to cook. But we rather go and eat doni kebab. You know what doni kebab is made from? All the remnants of fat, all glued together, put together. And then they heat it all up and they sell it to us and we think, oh, it's the most tastiest thing ever. All the fat, the remnants. You know when your parents go and they go to the, the butchers and they say, we'll have five pound shoulder meat. The guy begins to chop and then the white bit, the remnants of the fat, they take to the side. And then start chopping the quality, the good meat, and they put it in the bag and they give it to you. All the waste, this bit, is put into a processor. It's put of herbs and a bit of onions added in. And then they process it, they make it into a donor, and they freeze it up and they sell it to you and I. And we say, this is the most delicious thing ever, especially when you knock it back with chili sauce and mayonnaise. But you don't know the damage that it's doing to you and I. The once upon a time active, healthy kid. The one who used to remember being top in football, running around, energetic, lively, clever, intelligent. He's become a zombie. He can't get out of bed in the mornings. He wants to stay up all night. Why? Because you are, you are a reflection of what you eat. If you eat bad, if you eat junk, you become junk. So we have to again make sure that we don't eat excessively. Also, <coughs> avoiding bad company is very important. There's an amazing passage in Surah as safat after Surah Yaseen, from verse 50 to 60, where Allah talks about an, an incident that takes place. When a group of men are sitting in Jannah, and like, you know, friends who have spent a, 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 an amazing time in the dunya, they used to practice and they used to go to the Druz all together and they lived together, they saw good times together, they saw bad times together, and now they're reunited in Jannah. And one of the men asks the group of them, he said, he's looking around, he said, what, what happened to so-and-so? I can't see him amongst us, what's happened to him? And then because Jannah is Jannah, Allah makes the bottom, the floor open up. There's like a window that opens up. And the man who asked the question, he looks down and he sees the same guy he was asking about. The same guy and his hands are up and he's burning in Jahannam. And he's saying, help, help. And the man is shocked to see that person he was asking about being punished in Jahannam. And you know the question he asks? You know the thing that he says? He didn't say, Ah, oh, Allah, please give him a chance. I want to help him. He said, He says, Subhanallah, you nearly took me with you. He points to him and he said, You nearly took me with you. I was so close to chilling out with you on those days. You know, when you used to drive around in your Mercedes Benz and your cars and hired out and just going around with the music on. And you say, Come on, jump in. What's wrong with you? I was so close. I was so close to going to the nightclubs with you. 
And then he's going to see the punishment. And then Allah is going to close that window. And he's going to turn to his friends and he's going to say, Subhanallah, he's, it's almost like he's had a reintroduction into Jannah. He's going to say, there's going to be no punishment. Because he's actually seen punishment. And he's going to say, we're not going to die anymore. We're going to live here forever. He's going to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's very important to understand who is your company. Because you don't want to be that person. Who is the one who's jacked the lad, who wants to drive around, look at me, designer wear, I'm this, I'm that, bling bling. And the one who's burning in Jahannam. And the guys at the top saying, whoa, we were that close to chilling out with this guy. He always used to say, come on, enjoy your life for a bit more, what are you doing? And we used to think, yeah, why not, let's go and see. But we didn't. So this is very important to make sure who is the company that you're keeping. This has another reflection on your desires. Are you going to control your desires and make sure that you hang around with the right crowd? And again, you have to make sure that you avoid free mixing. Avoid those places where there's no segregation. Because your eyes are the window to the dunya. And shaitan is there and he's going to make you see things. And he's going to incite desire and love in your heart. You got, and this is what's happening these days. You know, there's people who come up to me oh, and, and they want to speak to you in private. And you're thinking, okay, everything okay, please, I want a word. And you think, okay, maybe he's a young guy, maybe he's passionate about the deen. Maybe he's saying, look, can you sort me out? Can you, can you get me a reference to go to Medina University? I want to study the religion. Maybe he's saying, look, I want to go and you know, strive in the way of Allah. Or maybe he's saying, look, I want to go and join a charity and help our brothers and sisters. Or maybe you know, he wants to talk to you about something and he's really passionate about the deen. So you take him to the room, you say, what's up? What's up? And he says, oh, <laughs> she's broke my heart. I wanted to go out with her and she's broke my heart, I can't sleep, you know, I can't, I can't get over this woman. SubhanAllah, this is the state of our youngsters these days. Why? Again, no segregation. No staying away from the opposite gender. Letting your eyes see what they weren't supposed to, your feet follow. You go and you make contact with somebody and there's no barakah in this. There's no ni'mah from Allah, it's all fitna from shaitan. Six months, one year later when you have feelings for the opposite gender, and then it goes downhill. And then it goes downhill. And then you become depressed, anxiety, sorrow. I wanted to marry her, but she's gone with somebody else, or her rishta with somebody else. Or she's done this, or she's done that. SubhanAllah, again, why were we not being segregated? Why did we not follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this is something that's happening quite frequently on the campuses, universities. Again, if we do not control our gaze and we do not stay away from these mixed gatherings, then again we are going to be the victims of shaitan who's going to make us follow. And this is why I say, brothers and sisters, weddings. Weddings. Weddings are getting worse and worse. Your sisters and my sisters are being exposed to people. Predators out there. Now, if things weren't that Worse before, now it's music and DJs intoxicating the desires. Men and women dancing, you know, just oblivious to what's going on. No haya left. And if you ask them, what's this? Oh, this is khushi, this is the happiness. What's wrong with you, Molvis? Weren't people getting married at the time of the Prophet ﷺ? Weren't people getting married? Of course they were. But the Prophet ﷺ, he ensured that people did not come into an environment where they were let loose to their desires. And we all know the famous narration of the blind companion. When he came to the Messenger ﷺ and he knocked on the door and the Prophet was with his two wives, he was talking to them. And he said, who is it? And he said, it is me, O Messenger of Allah. And he said to his wives, go next door. I said, O Messenger of Allah, why should we go next door? He can't see, he's blind. We don't have to do parda from him, but the Prophet said, are you blind? You can see, can't you? What's to say that nothing will generate desire in your heart? And then we have our sisters watching Bollywood drama at home, our mother star plus, Shah Rukh Khan, Salman Khan. This is our downfall, my brothers and sisters. We let them go to the weddings. And you think they're sitting there? They are also glaring around. 
in the same way you are glaring at the women, they are also looking at men. Wow, he's attractive. Wow, he's tall, dark and handsome. You're saying, wow, she's pretty. They're also saying he's like this. And to make it worse, the music of shaitan, the love songs, the lyrics of man loves woman, I love you, I want to get married to you, love, love, power, everything is being bombarded and then we send them there. Why? No need to. Try and abstain from these functions. Tell people, you go to the nikah, go later to see the bride and the groom, take them a gift. Say, we're not happy, we're not upset that you're not getting married, we're happy here. But we don't like this social gathering where there's no segregation. Men and women sitting together, music playing. Forget the bradri. Forget, you know, the uh, rishtadari. We love Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is no pleasing the creation over the creator. We please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we please the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa We never conform to the creation over the Creator. Once they start following Allah and His Messenger, then we are happy to be partake in these. Because when they see you brothers with the beards sitting there, they would say, maybe it is jais, it's halal. Because Mulvi Sahib was sitting there, he didn't get up and say this is wrong, he was sitting there eating, smiling, so it's jais. You have to stay away from these gatherings brothers because they're getting worse and worse. Whatever they're watching on Star News, Bollywood, they are replicating in their daily lives. They want to be like this dramas and we can see the disaster that's happening. And another thing that I want to mention that these superstars and Bollywood film actors and Lollywood and Hollywood that we have, Wallahi they have no peace and sukoon and aman in their lives. Wallahi they have no aman. You know these people that, you know, women say, whoa, he's handsome and our men say, oh, she's pretty. They have no aman. Divorce after divorce after divorce. You know, Tom Cruise, you know how many divorces he's been through? And the most recent divorce that he had, you know, when he got married to his uh, recent wife that he just divorced after eight, ten years. When she married him, they said, what made you attracted to uh, Tom Cruise? She said, when I was watching him growing up, he was my ideal man. He was just so, he, oh, I would never want to be with anybody else. And five or six years later, why are you divorced? If success was marrying that man and he was the ideal man, then why are you divorced? Again, this is a trap of shaitan. He wants you to look at the opposite gender, have no haya, have no modesty. And again, this is something that we understand and this is happening day in, day out. You want love stories? You know how youngsters want love stories? They, love, they have love. If you want a love story, there's a story in Arabic which has been translated about Suhaila and Farooq. You know about Suhaila and Farooq? They lived at the time of the Messenger وسلم, after the, the time of the Messenger وسلم, after the time of the Khulafa Rashidin, time of Imam Malik. So who was Suhail, Suhail and Farooq? Farooq was a man who was an uprighteous, muttaqi, a pious guy, God fearing. And his passion when he was growing up in Medina was to go and do jihad. Like Islam was expanding. And he would want to be like the armies that would go out and do jihad. And he would long to do this when he was growing up. And then his parents had other ideas. They said, look, Farooq, you're 20 years old. We want to get you married off. And he was like, oh, marriage. Look, I want to go and do jihad. They go, no, get married off, uh, Farooq. So who did they marry him to? They marry him to Suhaila. And who was Suhaila? Suhaila was again a sister who was pious. Who believed in Allah and the Messenger, very much preserved her haya, modesty. And Suhaila and Farooq got married. <coughs> and both of them were uprighteousness and followed Islam properly. And all oh, the whole village used to talk about Suhaila and Farooq. Wherever Suhaila was, there was Farooq. They would get up together and they would pray. They would recite Quran together. They would even run against each other because this was the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. When he ran with Aisha and he had a race with her, they would even do this together. They would relive and reenact the Sunnah. And then one day, Suhaila was very happy because she was pregnant. And she was ready to break the news to Farooq that you're going to be a father. And as she was about to break the news, the people in Medina heard from the loud, from the, from the Azan, the Muazzin, Hayya al jihad Hayya al jihad come to jihad, we need troops. We need people to go and do jihad. We need the youngsters, we need the men. 
and she saw the look of hesitancy in the eyes of Farooq. He was loving being with his wife. <coughs> and now the call of jihad came. And she saw the Farooq who was passionate about jihad, he became hesitant, he stood there. And then she says, Farooq, what's wrong with you? Go out there, take your sword, go and fight in the way of Allah. Help our sisters and mothers and protect and preserve Islam. Go out and push Islam to the borders. What are you doing standing here? And they both embraced each other and they both began to cry. And he went with the expedition and he left us some money. He said, here's some money. And if I don't make it, I'm going to leave you something in a box. Only open the box. If I never ever make it, if I die, then open from the box. And they both hug and they cry and they go. And she didn't have the chance to tell him that you're going to be a father. Faru goes out and he fights. Suhaila, she delivers the baby months later. And she's always waiting for Farooq. And whenever the expedition came back four months later, she would go and see if Farooq was in the expedition. And she would ask the people, where's Farooq? Is he here? They would say, no, we haven't seen Farooq. We don't know what's happened to Farooq. And then again, she began to cry, what's happened to Farooq? Six more months passed, another expedition came back to Medina. And she would run out, where's Farooq? Where's the father of my child? And again, Farooq, he's not there. Until somebody said, oh Suhaila, give up. I'm sure I saw Farooq fall in battle. I'm sure I saw him fall off his horse and he took a hit. I think Farooq is no more Suhaila. Give up your life and carry on. And to this Suhaila began to cry. And she got her baby and she placed him next to her chest and she began to cry. And then she went and she began to open the box, exactly what Farooq said. And then she began to take from the box. There was money left in the box. And she began to take from the box. Now many years later, many years later, on the outskirts, on the borders of a country many, many miles away, there was a man who was looking at the stars in the sky on a clear dark night. And he was reminiscing about the beauty of Allah. How amazing Allah's creation is. And as he was reminiscing and he was looking at the stars, a thought came to his mind, Suhaila, my wife, my wife, I have been in the passion of jihad, the, ze the zealous, the enthusiasm, the motivation, and I've been fighting and going with the armies forward, 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 and I've got to the border of China, and I left my wife behind. What's happened to Suhaila? Has she got married again? Has she, she died? Has she moved on? What's happened? And then all these thoughts begin to come to his mind. He goes to his commander. He says, I've left my wife. It's been 20, 30 years. I've just been so focused on jihad, staying with the army. I forgot about her. I said, please give me leave. And he said, of course, get on your horse and go. So he gets on his horse and he begins to gallop and gallop and gallop, thinking in his mind, is she dead? Is she alive? What's happened? What's happened? Until months later, he arrives on the outskirts of Medina. And then he goes into Medina and Farooq being Farooq, he just doesn't go straight home like you and I. First he goes to the masjid to give the two rakat when you come back from your travels. And he decides to go to the masjid and he prays his two rakat. And as he enters the masjid, he sees how the masjid has expanded. And when he finishes, he says, Subhanallah, haven't the Muslims done well? How big the masjid has become, Masjid Nabawi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How amazing it is. And then he realizes there's about half an hour left for the prayer. So he says, I'll stay and I'll pray the prayer and then I'll go home. And as he's looking around, he sees there are many durus taking place. And in particular, he's amazed at this one scholar. This one scholar who has so many people around him. And he can just see the scholar from a distance, but he's amazed at the way he's speaking. He can't see his face. He can just... Make eye says, what an amazing scholar. How much knowledge has this guy got? Amazing. He prays his prayer with the congregation and then he makes his way home. His heart is heavy. Will Suhaila remember me? Will she be dead? Has she got married again? How am I going to take the news of Suhaila getting married again? And then he recognizes his house. And he's about to go into his house. He can see his door in front of him. And as he's about to go, he ties up his horse. He sees a man just about to enter or actually leave the house. 
and jealousy overcomes him. How dare a man he's just left my house? Who is this man? How dare he go to my house? And then he calls the man from the back and then he says, who are you? And the man says, who are you? And then they become pushing and shoving each other. And then they begin arguing with each other. And then it's all mayhem and people are coming and they're trying to split these two up and he's shouting, how dare you come out to my house? And the man said, what do you mean your house? Who are you? And then inside the house is a lone lady, Suhaila. As she can hear the shouting, as she can hear the melee, and she's saying, this sounds like Farooq, my Farooq. And she gets up and she goes outside and she sees Farooq. And she says to everybody, stop, stop, this is my Farooq. Who went in the way of Allah, he went for battle and he's been away for such a long time. This is Farooq, leave him, he's come back. And they separate the two men and they enable, and allow Farooq to go in and everybody's shocked. Farooq, this is Farooq, because his physical appearance had changed. And they all begin to cry and they go inside and Suhaila and Farooq, they both begin to cry. And they embrace each other. And Farooq sits down and he says, it's been such a long time. It's been such a long time. How have you been, Suhaila? And she said, I've been well, alhamdulillah. And he, then he said, tell me, I've been fighting and traveling for lo so long, I have no money left. Tell me, we, our lives are going to start back up again. Tell me the money that I left for you. What's happened to that money? And she said, forget about the money. Forget about the money. Tell me. Did you go to Masjid Nabawi sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Because she knew that Farooq was a person who was upon the sunnah. That he must have gone to the masjid. He said, yes. So tell me, what did you see? He said, the masjid was just amazing. It had grown so much. It's expansion taking place. And I saw the scholars, wow, the scholars were something else. They were amazing. He said, yes, tell me something else. Which scholar in particular did you like? He said, there was this scholar. He was just amazing. His name was Sheikh Abdul Rahman. And he was so amazing. And he was just so good and wow, amazing. And she said, what would you give to be? To be like Sheikh Abdul Rahman. He said, I would give anything because that guy was something else. He was on a different level. And she said, what would you give to be the father of Sheikh Abdul Rahman? And he said, I'd give everything to be the father of Sheikh Abdul Rahman. She said, that person that you didn't get a glimpse of, but you understood him to be Abdul Rahman, who you were even fighting with outside because you didn't recognize him, that is your son. And the money that you gave me, I spent each and every penny on him, his tarbiyah, making sure that he was given education. Making sure that I made him a scholar that you would one day be proud of. And he fell down and he began to cry. My son is Sheikh Abdul Rahman. My son is Sheikh Abdul Rahman. And he began to cry. And the people began to cry. And it's narrated that one of the youngsters who was pulling and dragging them away when they were fighting was none other than Imam Malik. Rahimullah. Why was Imam Malik there? Because Sheikh Abdul Rahman was the teacher of Imam Malik. So this, my brothers and sisters, is about love. You know, we look at love from Hollywood and Bollywood. No, love is when you follow Islam based on Quran and Sunnah and you leave all your affairs to Allah and you follow Islam, you pray five times a day, you observe everything. Allah is the one who puts the love into the heart of the other person. And you, became, you become really firm and resolute in your relationship together. So this is something that we must strive towards. So I want to finish and conclude by saying the inclinations and the desires of this dunya are part of your fitra. The opposite gender, music, food, all these are a part of our fitra. Allah has placed this inside us. But there is also a solution as to how we can control them. And we must understand that as Muslims, there is a leveled approach, the way we live, the way we conduct our lives. That if we follow this approach and follow Islam based upon these parameters, this framework that we have in place, then know that success lies in following this. And we will then indeed, inshallah, by the permission of Allah, be saved from Jahannam. And like I began the talk, I want to end the talk 
with that hadith that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that when Allah created Jahannam He called upon the angel Jibreel Alayhi Salam and he said go and see what I have prepared for those who go against me and Jibreel Alayhi Salam he went and he saw the punishment of Jahannam one part of the flame enveloping another consuming another the horrors the horrific sight and he came back and said, Oh Allah, by your glory, there will be no one who will enter Jahannam. It's so scary. Then Allah surrounded Jahannam with all kinds of desires, lusts, role models, Bollywood, Lollywood, music, dance, interests, zina, drinking, things that make us run towards these things. And then he said, Go and see Jibreel al Islam. Jibreel went and he saw all these desires surrounding Jahannam. Surrounding Jahannam and he came back and he said, Oh Allah, by your glory there will be no one. There will be no one who will be saved from Jahannam. May Allah make us of those who understand the reality of the dunya. That Jahannam is surrounded by all those things that you and I find attractive. The music, the fashions, the gangster lifestyle, the hip hop, the women, the drink, the power, the fame all going to lead us to Jahannam and may Allah make us of those who really strive mm. and follow the Quran and the Sunnah and overcome the hardships and the difficulties of the dunya indeed success in la lies in following this path